Next on Currents News, a new attack on the sanctity of life in New York. Governor Andrew Cuomo backs an assisted suicide bill. Catholics are fighting back. Protecting unborn infants from abortion, the U.S. Catholic Church is supporting Senate action to prevent pain. In just a few weeks, the Brooklyn Diocese will hold a mass for victims of sexual abuse. I'm Emily Druby, and I have the inside look. Plus, an exclusive report on the steps Christ climbed before his crucifixion. After centuries, the site is about to reopen to the public. The news starts right now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Fobles. Catholic leaders are fighting back tonight after Governor Andrew Cuomo said he's in favor of a physician-assisted suicide law in New York. It's not the first time such a bill has been up for debate. Catholic opposition has blocked it before, but Cuomo says he's pushing ahead. In an interview on public radio, Governor Andrew Cuomo said he would back legislation enabling terminally ill people to request life-ending medication. I say pass the bill. It's a controversial see. issue. It's a difficult issue. But uh, the older we get and the better medicine gets, the more we've seen people suffer for too, too long. These were the governor's first public comments about physician-assisted suicide. Though his comments were brief, the process is not as simple. According to the New York Medical Aid in Dying Act, currently under consideration in both the Assembly and the Senate, terminally ill adults with a prognosis of six months or less can request life-ending medication from their physician. At least two doctors must confirm the patient is eligible for medical aid and capable of making an informed decision about their own health care. Additionally, the patient must be able to take the medication themselves. Reaction to the governor's support of the suicide bill has been swift. Dennis Paust, a spokesman for the New York State Catholic Conference, called Cuomo's backing unexpected. We're distressed to hear the governor's remarks yesterday. Um, we know where he stands on a lot of issues. This is one where he's never shown his cards before. Uh, so it was something new for, for everyone on both sides of the issue. Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio, leader of the Brooklyn Diocese, strongly opposes the measure. He criticized lawmakers in February of this year, saying they are not so much concerned with the merits of policy, but simple political opportunism. Not satisfied with the destruction of human life up until the moment of birth, our leaders wish to make it easier to take a vulnerable human life that is suffering from the ravages of old age and illness. The proposed assisted suicide legislation is as merciful as much as the Reproductive Health Act is about health care. Despite the Catholic Church's vigilant pushback against any legalization of assisted suicide, similar laws are already on the books in seven states, New Jersey, Hawaii, Oregon, Vermont, Washington, Montana, and the District of Columbia. Paus believes all opponents of the bill, not only Catholics, should not give in to the pressure from lawmakers. This isn't a Catholic issue. This is an issue of what's best for society. Just a couple of weeks ago in Maryland, a measure that would have legalized medically assisted suicide was defeated. Powell sees this as a positive sign. Uh, we're going to fight this. We're going to continue to fight it. The New York State Catholic Conference is offering a number of anti-suicide resources people can use to fight back. The information is at nyscatholic.org. Click on the No to Assisted Suicide page. U.S. Catholics are mobilizing tonight to stop what one bishop calls the barbaric practice of late-term abortion. The battle for life is now being fought in the Senate. Currents News' Tim Harfman has the latest on the debate. America's at her best when she's standing up for the least among us. We know that an unborn child at the 20th week of pregnancy can feel pain. Protecting the unborn against abortion, Senate Judiciary Chairman Lindsey Graham led the fight on Capitol Hill Tuesday. He's in favor of the pain-capable Unborn Child Protection Act, which would restrict abortions after the fifth month of pregnancy. We should have restrictions on abortion. You can only imagine the pain that comes from dismemberment. U.S. bishops also backed the bill. The head of the bishop's pro-life committee, Archbishop Joseph Nauman, said, quote, with the vast majority of Americans strongly supporting a ban on late-term abortions, it is time for Congress to pass this bill. I also pray that consideration of the bill moves our country closer to recognizing all unborn babies as legal persons worthy of our love and respect. Jeannie Mancini, president of the March for Life, said most Americans favor the legislation. We're talking 
eight out of 10 Americans for 10 years strong, including six out of 10 pro-choice Americans, would limit abortion more than it's limited in the United States. Fred Trabolsi, the executive director of Life Center of New York, a crisis pregnancy center in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, praised the bill. We're becoming inhuman as a society, and we hope that some of these steps that hopefully will be passed will show that we are a caring nation. In the House, a similar measure is stalled in a Democrat-controlled body. Catholic leaders and Republicans are fighting to move it forward. Last week, Bishop DiMarzio spoke out strongly, calling on Catholics to act. There are many people mobilized in the name of the unborn, and I encourage the Brooklyn and Queens faithful to contact their congressional representative on this critical issue. Tim Harfman, Currents News. Health officials are scrambling tonight to stop a measles outbreak spreading across the country. Brooklyn is facing a public health emergency. As we first reported yesterday, the number of cases is surging nationwide. Kelly Smoot has the very latest. We have a very serious situation on our hands. The rapid spread of measles is becoming a serious health issue nationwide. And with at least 465 cases reported across 19 states, public officials are taking a tough stance in an effort to stop the highly contagious disease. In New York City, where more than half of this year's cases have been reported, some unvaccinated people will now be required to get the vaccine or face a fine. Today, we are declaring a public health emergency effective immediately. This will mandate vaccines for people living in the affected area. And in Washington state, lawmakers are working on a bill to ban personal exemptions to the MMR vaccine. But yeah, health officials acknowledge some parents do have concerns. A doctor telling me either vaccinate or get out is not going to answer those concerns that I have. And are trying to work to educate them. All parents are trying to do the best for their children. We're working with community leaders, faith-based leaders, other trusted voices in the community. Kelly Smoot, Current News. New York City is in a state of emergency, a public health emergency in parts of Brooklyn. Mayor Bill de Blasio declaring yesterday that the measles is hitting levels not seen in many years. This outbreak has been spreading. There are almost 300 cases already, overwhelmingly in Brooklyn. The only way to stop this outbreak is to ensure that those who have not been vaccinated get the vaccine. Now, the mayor ordered unvaccinated people living in certain Williamsburg zip codes must get vaccinated immediately. Those who didn't comply face fines. Trouble is, the move is at odds with the beliefs of some, particularly in the Orthodox Jewish community. Rabbi Brad Hirschfield is the president of the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership and joins us now to discuss that very topic. Rabbi, thank you so much for being with us. I talked so here. much about how intriguing this is. Does this vaccination order clash with religious freedom? It well might as formulated. The challenge is that there is room within the law for people to claim that they don't vaccinate vaccinate for religious reasons. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, we have not compelled people in this country to have health care that runs at odds with their personal religious beliefs. So I actually think the mayor is 100% right about his concern, but has probably found a somewhat ham-fisted, if you'll forgive the expression, sure. in an Orthodox <laughs> Jewish setting, a somewhat ham-fisted no way of addressing it. No judgments. Rabbi, some rabbis have uh, issued proclamations that everyone should vaccinate with Passover, especially fast approaching. We're going to have families congregating together. Why are some communities, especially the Orthodox Jewish communities, uh, apparently resisting? So it's not officially any one community, and it's not even the ultra-Orthodox community. It's mm. a tiny minority within the largely Hasidic world. Okay. So a segment of a segment of a segment. Okay, good perspective. Thank you. So mm -hmm. we, again, we shouldn't think there's large numbers of people. Not that that matters. More than half the cases of measles reported this year have happened in these a few zip codes that are affected in Brooklyn. So there is reason to be concerned. Now, you ask why? There is no religious grounds that even the official leadership of this community stands on for this. These are individuals who I think are about as much as anything trying to pick an area where they can express themselves outside of rabbinic law.
And we should know, they are being supported by the anti-vaccination movement, which has nothing to do with anything Jewish or any particular religion. So I think what you have is the intersection of outside people mm -hmm. who have a passionate commitment to this belief that vaccines are dangerous, no medical proof for that, and a small number of people who are looking for a way to express their independence mm -hmm. on an issue which rabbinic authority has not told them you must, you, you, you're not allowed to do that. Because overwhelmingly, rabbinic authorities said, you must vaccinate. Rabbi, keeping that in mind and all of that in perspective, here's a tough question. At what point does someone's personal freedom, no matter how small the group, mm -hmm. and another person's rights begin? When my practice of religion, as I see fit, puts you at risk, hmm. we've crossed the line. Okay. Failing to vaccinate is not only tragically and stupidly about putting these kids, because mostly kids were affected, in the families that refuse vaccination at risk. It's putting your kids and my kids at risk. And that's where the bright line to me exists between the freedom of your religious practice and the health of all of us as a, as a society. Rabbi, we will take that as the perfect last word. Thank you very much. Thank Always you. great having you on with us. It's a pleasure. Sad circumstances, but an honor to be with you. The feds have broken up a billion dollar Medicare scam that preyed on hundreds of thousands of elderly and disabled patients. Doctors prescribing orthopedic braces that were not needed and billed Medicare for them. Two dozen people are under arrest ranging from corporate executives to medical professionals. The Justice Department calls it one of the largest health care frauds in U.S. history. A new gun law passed New Zealand's parliament today less than a month after the mosque massacre. The measure bans most semi-automatic weapons. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern spoke to the lawmakers. 50 people died and they do not have a voice. We in this house are their voice. And today, Mr Speaker, we have used that voice wisely. We are here just 26 days after the most devastating of terrorist attacks created the darkest of days in New Zealand's history. And we are here as an almost entirely united parliament. The law is expected to go into effect on Friday. 26 days ago, 50 Muslim worshippers were gunned down in the city of Christchurch, victims of terrorist attacks on two mosques. Benjamin Netanyahu has been re-elected to a record-setting fifth term as Israeli Prime Minister. With nearly all the votes counted, Netanyahu the winner in a tight race against former military chief Benny Gantz. Gantz conceded the contest. President Trump congratulated Netanyahu on his triumph, calling him a great ally and friend. There's a lot more news headed your way. A special look at abuse survivors getting ready for something they requested from Bishop DiMarzio. The bishop's message to Catholics ahead of Holy Week and a boy living his faith every day are two of the exclusive articles in the tablet, a previews ahead, and a story that can only be seen on Currents News. It's about the steps Christ climbed before his crucifixion. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at thesalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. There is healing, there is help. Those are the fruits of the Brooklyn Diocese Annual Mass of Hope and Healing. Anthony Hughes of the Diocese Survivors Advisory Committee described them as he and others prepare for the liturgy. Currents News' Emily Druby has the story. During a preparation meeting for the Brooklyn Diocese Annual Mass of Hope and Healing, Anthony Hughes takes a moment to make an offering. Back in the late 1980s, early 1990s, Hughes was abused by a priest. Now he's a member of the Diocese of Brooklyn Survivors Advisory Committee. Well, one, we believe that there is a God, and we believe that God uh, comes first in our lives, and we feel that um, prayer and, and type of healing does come from God himself. So I think it's important that we keep turning to him for help. That committee, pictured here in a previous meeting, is made up of survivors, secondary victims, and professionals in the field of child protection. Together, they plan the diocese's mass of hope and healing. The liturgy is offered for survivors of abuse and everyone impacted by sexual abuse, like parents. I think what it does promote, um, there is healing, there is help. 
This is the fifth time the mass is being held. Jasmine Salazar, the vice chancellor and victim assistance coordinator for the Brooklyn Diocese, explains it was born at the request of survivors and works as a supplement to the services already offered by the diocese. There was a need for something more. There was a need to let other survivors and victims know that the church cares the church um, is here for you. The confidentiality of everyone in attendance will be respected. From the readings to the music to the prayer card, everything at the Mass is chosen by survivors. They really take a lot of time into planning specific details to make this a very special experience that is sensitive to survivors and that also speaks to survivors. The Mass of Hope and Healing is being held here at St. Athanasius on April 30th at 7 p.m. It's open to anyone who wants to attend. In Bensonhurst, Emily Drewby, Currents News. And for anyone unable to attend the Mass, it will be televised live on NetTV again. That will be at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, April 30th. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops established what is known as the Dallas Charter in 2002 to combat and prevent sexual abuse. Some of the measures include creating the Office of Victim Assistance to help individuals who come forward with allegations of abuse. The office provides counseling, referrals for therapy, and other important resources. Every employee of the Brooklyn Diocese, including students, undergoes mandatory training designed to spot the signs of abuse and how to stop it. Bishop DiMarzio meets with survivors and listens to them carefully, and one result of those talks is the Hope and Healing Mass. The diocese also has a toll-free and confidential sexual abuse reporting line. That number is 888-634-4499. And for even more information, go to the Diocese of Brooklyn's website, dioceseofbrooklyn.org, and click on Protecting Our Children. Bishop DiMarzio is getting ready for Holy Week, and a boy is living his faith with the help of others. Two of the special stories in the tablet this week, and to preview them, Editor-in-Chief Jorge Dominguez joins us now. Jorge, thank you so much. Bishop you, DiMarzio Liz. sending a special message to the people of the Brooklyn Diocese for Holy Week. What did he say? Well, it's a movie message. He's, uh, you know, we are preparing for, for Holy Week, but at the same time, we are preparing for the, for the mass of hope and healing for, for sexual abuse survivors. Mm -hmm. and, and Bishop DeMarcio establishes a comparison in his column between the two. It says, we, we prepare for, for Holy Week, we go through Passion and then Resurrection. And then he explained how we prepare for the, for the Hope and, and Healing Mass and how the Diocese of Brooklyn is doing things because mm -hmm. we are going in this, you know, subject, we are going through, through a, you know, a real uh, very difficult recovery. Yeah. So mm -hmm. he says we have to prepare ourselves to resurrect too. It's a very, very moving and you know deep column. It's always so good to hear from Bishop DiMarzio. His insight is always just so sharp. There's one other story I want to preview for our viewers because it, it's a good story and for a good cause. Catholic student fighting cancer one fundraiser at a time. Just give us a brief preview of that. Oh, you are going to love that oh. story. <laughs> uh, th this, is, this is a fourth grader in uh, Fra St. Francis of Assisi Academy uh, in, in Astoria. Mm -hmm. And he had a kidney disease, I mean, since he was three years old. His big sister, who is a senior in high school, decided that she had to help his brother, her brother, you know, with the, with the, the disease. And she started a fundraising. Now he's helping to the, to the, in the fundraising. It is a movie story. You have to read it. I will definitely read it. It definitely sounds a feel-good story. You know how much I love those. Thank you so much for joining Thank me, Jorge. You. Two great stories. The Tablet, also your pro-life newspaper. You can follow the latest news about the sanctity of life in the printed version of the Tablet, which is in churches across the diocese right now, or could be in your mailbox with a subscription. Your support for the tablet is needed to ensure that Catholic journalism will thrive well into the future. So if you subscribe to the tablet, you'll save up to 55%. Go to the website, thetablet.org slash home 55, or you can call 877-883-8356. Brooklyn's Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio announced today the Reconciliation Monday will be held this year on Monday, April 15th, the Monday before Easter. On that day, every church in the Brooklyn Diocese will be open from 3 p.m. to 9 and will have a priest available for walk-in confessions in preparation for Easter. More information is available at dobq.org slash Lent. 
still to come on Currents News, an exclusive look at the stairs Jesus climbed to meet Pontius Pilate, something outsiders haven't seen for centuries, and a picture of a black hole, how scientists did it. We'll be right back. Scientists have released the first ever photo of a black hole. They combined the power of eight radio telescopes to capture that image. Black holes are massive amounts of matter compressed into a small area that creates a massive gravitational pull. This black hole is about 54 million light years away. Jesus walked up a marble staircase on the day he was crucified, the first Good Friday. Now, for the first time in centuries, pilgrims will be able to walk the way of Christ. Melissa Butts has an exclusive look. Tradition has it Jesus himself walked these 28 steps the day he was condemned to death in Pontius Pilate's palace. Now they're restoring them for an exceptional experience. For the first time in 300 years, pilgrims will be able to climb the Scala Santa, or the Holy Stairs, on the original marble that Jesus himself walked. This experience is only open for 60 days, from April 11th until Pentecost, when wood will be placed over the stairs yet again to preserve the soft marble. Since summer 2018, the stairs have been closed, with work ranging from the frescoes above to the last step of the marble stairs. It was necessary to restore the walnut wood that covered the 28 steps of the Holy Stairs. This walnut wood was put into place in 1723 by Pope Innocent XIII to protect the marble steps. The steps are very worn down by the faithful climbing them. Millions upon millions have climbed these stairs, seeking indulgences for the soul. I pellegrini possono prendere l'indulgenza plenaria. Pilgrims can get a plenary indulgence, which means remission for every stain of sin and every consequence of sin. The effort of this physical sacrifice allows us to feel concretely closer to Jesus' pain, experiencing pain and fatigue, like he experienced. Additionally, Father Francesco insists this experience draws believers closer to Christ through respect and devotion. Faith and tradition is also concretely marked along the way. One can see that there are crosses in certain places to protect where, according to tradition, Jesus fell and there are drops of blood. If you look closely near the cross, the marble is conserved very well, while as nearby it is very worn out. Tradition says these marble stairs were brought from Jerusalem by Emperor Constantine's mother, Saint Helena, once Christianity was the Roman Empire's main religion. The restoration of the entire sanctuary and the additional staircases located next to this one have taken six years. It should all be complete by summer 2020 to prepare for the millions more Christians who will make this pilgrimage in the future. For 400 years, pilgrims have been able to come here in Rome to take part in the Passion of Christ, walking directly in his footsteps on their knees. In Rome, Melissa Butts, Currents News. Back to you in New York, Liz. Thank you, Melissa. That is Currents News. I'm Liz Fobles. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.